stadium. I mean, geez, you know, it's, it's absolutely amazing. You know, when you go into the, that environment, I always get goosebumps because I remember every time I competed at an Olympic Games, uh, my first thing as I came through the tunnel was always to look for the British flag. You know, that's kind of my, oh, I'm here. Um, it would have been absolutely amazing to compete in the Olympic Games in your home turf. If I've competed in Commonwealth Games in Manchester, and that was just awesome. But my life's moved on, and there's others that, you know, I hope will even get 10% of the feeling I felt at the three Olympic Games I competed at. I look back at my races and I, I still feel probably all the emotions because I know what I went through to get there. I know how it felt to cross that line. And when I play in front of people that have seen me for the first time and I'm talking to them behind the scenes about what happened, it gets the energy up, you know, they're, they're almost <laughs> still thinking, did she, didn't she win it? I've kind of got used to watching things now. Before, it's like, I just want to be out there, you know, and you're kind of itching, but I think I've got to that point where I kind of know that I've done my bit and I'm quite comfortable with watching other people. But I didn't realise the impact what my, my two golds had meant on the country almost. And I think from looking back and listening to lots of people and now meeting millions of people, it was all about the fact that they got to know my journey and realise it wasn't an easier one. <laughs> Kelly was a child, she was a sweet little girl actually. I remember never liked getting her hands dirty. If she fell over in the mud, she would just absolutely cry because she didn't like it, not that she'd hurt herself. I didn't know my uh, biological father at all, so um, he's not been part of my life and isn't part of my life, so it's kind of the only side I know is uh, my mother. But I, throughout my my earlier life, so up to about, I was about four, I was kind of in and out of the, the home just because mum couldn't, you know, afford to uh, not work. Um, but she also got a job across the road at a kind of Unigate um, so that she could be closer. And I suppose it just, you know, becomes normality for you, the things that happen in life. So when I was at home, it almost, that was my home, you know. People that I was with, the kids that I played with, they were my friends, so you don't really think anything Store, I suppose the only thing I was, I know I was always upset hoping that my mum would come back to get me and things like that because, you know, when you are left there, you know, I suppose it does affect you because you don't know whether they're ever going to come back to get you. I know that, you know, she met uh, Mick Norris quite young, when I was quite young. She married him. When I was about five years old and I was a bridesmaid at the <laughs> wedding and I think I ruined every single photo <laughs> that there is. When I look back at the fact that, you know, there's a guy that one took a lady on with a, you know, four, five, or well, five-year-old kid at that stage, um, you know, essentially mixed race, all of that. But throughout my life, he's literally just been, you know, he's been there for everything. You know, he's there all the time. He'd do absolutely anything for me. So when they were younger, of course, they got whatever they could get, rented out a flat. And then uh, and then in Ryden Park, where my uh, dad, Mick, grew up, a, f a house came up there. Um, so we moved into the council house. Um, it was a two-bedroom house. And then we moved again, because my mum got pregnant, so we had to move again. You know, of course, it wasn't easy for for my mum at all. It wasn't easy for, you know, somebody not knowing one half of the family or really understanding anything about that. And then being in a family where, you know, essentially I've got different colour skin and then you have your brothers who are another colour and you're just thinking, oh, that's weird. <laughs> Why are we different? You know, I think those things only came when I was sort of five, six, seven years old, started questioning things. So it wasn't really school that made me have that identity check. It was more my brothers growing up and thinking, oh, they're like, <laughs> like different <laughs> colours and things. And then I remember walking home from school one day and asking my mum, and I think she like gulped, you know, because I was crossing the road to the thing and I just said to her, you know, why am I a different colour to Kevin and Stuart? You know, and she was like, <laughs> you know, this whole kind of, you know, what do you say? What comes out? And she just said, oh, you know, mix, mix not your kind of, 
real dad sort of thing, you know. And I suppose that was the only time that I started then thinking, oh my God, I'm different, you know. That's quite a weird thing when you're younger. It's quite a big impact, you know. It does have an impact on your life because you just suddenly then question everything. But you are who you are. I only know who I am. I don't know any different, you know. I don't know anything other than growing up in Kent with my mum and my brothers and my, my dad stepdad, uh, I don't know any other side of me. Things phased me at first, but then I kind of thought, well, get on with it, you know, it's like, you know, as I, I think I just went through school just enjoying what I did, you know, I loved my friends, I was quite active and sporty, you know, and I became games captain and prefect and all of that. I don't know, I think I was just a real active kid, honestly, I didn't stop, you know, mum used to have to take me to everything just to keep me calm, you know, I just would be out and about. I was always itching to do something, you know, and then I used to realise that actually I was going to get anything that I wanted. I was the one that's going to have to make my own money. So I got, you know, got um, bike rounds, you know, paper rounds and things, and because I was really active. I used to time myself from the time I go out home to the newspaper shop, look at the clock as I left the newspaper shop and see how long it would take me to get round my rounds. And then if I want to make extra money, of course, and it's before school, I'd have to do two rounds. So I'd get up even earlier. And because we didn't have a bus from my village down to my first secondary school, I used to have to bike to school. But I hated anything in the classroom. I mean, just drove me insane. I just couldn't take it in. I, I actually feel, and I, I actually think that I'm probably slightly dyslexic because I couldn't read and write probably when I was at primary school anyway and going to secondary school, I just you know, read books and it just like go over your head. But anything outside the classroom, so Duke of Edinburgh Awards, you know, doing PE or anything like that, I absolutely loved. And one of my PE teachers, Debbie Page, I remember um, her encouraging me like um, at our sports day to do this kind of 800 metre run. And I was up against some girls at two years above me. Now they used to always win every sports day, you know, kind of going in at well, the previous two years. And I remember going on this run and I just went. Off she goes like a flash and all, you know, the members of staff are going, she's going too fast, she won't last. That's it, the kids will catch her up. And you talk to the girls who were behind her saying, well, that's all right, we'll catch her up because she'll slow down. But of course, Kelly didn't slow down. And there she finished her two laps um, probably 300 metres, 200 metres in front of the rest of them. And those two girls are like so miffed because, you know, they saw me, this little gangly little kid with an afro hair, you know, running around and they thought that I'd gone off so fast that I'm bound to like give up and run, but I just kept going. You know, and after that, Debbie was saying to me, right, you've got to join, you know, you've got to be in the school cross country. And I was like, not having any of it because I hated wet, wind, cold, mud, all of it. Of course, that's what cross country is, isn't it? Her first reaction when I asked her would she run in this cross country race was no. But she was laughing, wasn't serious, no. And I said, you can, I don't think I could do that. I don't think I can do that. Go on, just do it for me. Oh, well, I don't know, but yeah, Missy, it's raining or whatever. But in the end, she said yes. I really didn't want to do it. And I was like, right, okay, I'll, I'll do it, you know. So anyway, I went in and uh, I'm now standing on the start line, all the other kids are standing there and there's a girl next to me called Stacey Washington. And I ended up shocking myself because 50 metres before the end, I'm like in front, you know, and suddenly like Stacey Washington came past me and beat me. I was so gutted that she'd beaten me. Suddenly that was like my, my whole, um, I don't know, a whole kind of competitive spirit came out thinking, oh God, yeah, I was really disappointed that this girl had beat me. Stacey, and I didn't realise that she was number one in the age group. She, you know, she'd won all the Kent Championships, the schools, champs, Kent schools, all of this lot. And I was so pissed off that she beat me that I was thinking, right, so I went back to school and that's it. I started like athletics and it was Debbie that said to me, oh, I think you should join an athletics club. Yes, she did have that ability to be able to run distances. And, you know, she had a lovely stride pattern. She looked good to watch, to watch her run even then. And so, if you've got someone with that ability, you've just got to give them that gentle nudge to push them to then, if you're good in your school and you're beating people, you've got to move on to the next step. So the next step is you push them to the local club. She called my mum 
Mum took me down to the track in Tunbridge and as she dropped me off, she said, you better stick at this one, <laughs> you know, because I tried everything and given up after like, you know, two or three days or a week I might have lasted at gymnastics or something. We tried a lot of things with Kelly. We've tried horse riding, um, which she didn't particularly like. Ballet, which wasn't Kelly at all. Gymnastics, she was quite into her gymnastics actually. She did quite enjoy that. That was my abiding memory of her dropping me off, not like, oh, have fun. And you better stick at it. Anyway, little did she know that I was going to, you know, take to it. And I went down the club and the guy there who we met was called Dave Arnold and he was in his welly boots, his little flap hat, his long jacket. And he just said to me, right, I want you to go with that group and run. And that's what I did. Where we're going into now is Tunbridge Boys School track and my mother dropped me off. So that building wasn't there on the side. There was this building, but it wasn't this big. And there was a hut just around the corner. My mother dropped me off on this little hill here and told me, you better not pick this one up. <laughs> you better stick at this one. And this is a track that I came down, same track. Uh, and I met Dave. Dave had a real impact on my life from when I was young. You know, again, you don't really, you don't really think about it or respect it, I suppose, until you're a bit older and you think back about, you know, the time he gave up away from his family, like most volunteers do. You know, when you're a club athlete, especially back then, but even so now, you know, all of these people that are coaches give up their, you know, they do it for the love of their sport, you know, and you don't really respect that when you're young kids. You just, you know, they were your coach. Because I got into my athletics from the age of 12, that almost became my life quite quickly. You know, and I found that it was something that I could, I don't know, enjoy and love that sense of progression and seeing that I had achieved something. Because I think I didn't, because I wasn't good at school, I didn't feel like I achieved anything at school. I just always felt like I was rubbish. So actually in athletics and running, I felt good about my, it made me feel good about myself. She would go out running on her own because none of her friends were into athletics. And for somebody, a young teenager, shall we say, um, to do that on her own, there must have been something there that, you know, she was happy doing with it, even though she used to keep complaining. So these are the fields that I have done many, many, many elapsed and session rounds. The fields that my coach, the first day I got here, my coach told me that I've got to run around these fields and I've got to talk to the people in the group. I was like, what do you mean talk? And then it's what taught me about my breathing pattern of running, to be able to talk to people whilst you're running. What does that mean? Is that a thing that you can control your breathing? Yeah, right? so that when you're running on your own, you're in control of your breathing, you can hear it, listen to it. You have to be somebody with a certain mentality to dedicate yourself to athletics and want to be good at it. As I went through the years, I was better than a lot of people, so they couldn't then train with me. So it would literally be me and my coach down at the track. He would be blowing the whistle. I'll be trying to hit the times, you know, go through the pain and the, you know, you're pushing your bodies to the limit. Um, but it's what I loved. She used to want me to go out on the bike with her, which was um, a bit of a joke, really, because I couldn't keep up with her, even though she was... Her slow was my fast pedalling. Um, I'll say one, one occasion up Cold Harbour Lane, I was uh, cycling and suddenly came off the bike. Um, Kelly was way in front, but she did actually come back to see me in the middle of the road. But all she said to me was that I was spoiling her training. <laughs> Not, are you all right, Mum, you know, and that sort of stuff. <laughs> Even though I'd, I'd been very successful when I was a junior, you know, really successful. Six months after starting running, I was all England champion, English school, so and that's why I enjoyed it. I loved it because I could see that I was progressing. But I don't know, I think that drive to be someone and to actually have a career, I'm quite sort of, in my mind, a career-minded person. I want to do something. And we had the careers officers come round to our school. Uh, Navy, Army, Air Force. And I remember them coming in showing us a, a video of the army. This guy screaming and shouting at all these other guys going, you know, 
over the uh, wall and under the scramble necks and swinging on the ropes. I was like, oh my God, yeah. <laughs> I was like, that is it. I remember going home and saying to mum, I'm going to join the army. And she's like, no, you're not. I went, I'm going to join the army. You've got to take me to the army careers office. You just thought, oh yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, she'll forget about it in a few weeks time. And of course they told me I was too young. And they said, oh, you have to come back when you're 17 and nine months old. I was like, 17, nine months old, I was like 14. And then finally, I was 17, they told me I could go back when I was 17 to do what's called a barbs test. So it means you can do all the tests to see what job you'd like to do. But I was adamant I wanted to be a physical training instructor. She wanted to be a PTI, um, but there was no available spaces. And she got a few options. And the option she chose was to be a driver because she was she didn't, not office material and that sort of thing. So yeah, she found that quite exciting, I think. I was like, oh my God, H2E driver, yeah. So anyway, I uh, am back, signed up, did my oath in March 88. And that was it. I joined up and became a HTV driver just before my 18th birthday. Now I really thought that once I joined the army, I will be in for my whole 22 year service and I gave up my athletics to join. And I remember going to tell Dave that I was going to join the army and he just, he was distraught. He really didn't want me to go in. He just said, you're wasting your career and you know, you've know you got so much bright future. And He was really upset. And I was saying to her how he was feeling. And I said, it was like piggy in the middle. And she was telling me how she was feeling and he should be pleased for her and all this sort of stuff. So it was quite a conflict. And I say, I was, I was in the middle. But obviously, you know, Kelly went and he had to accept it. I remember getting off um, at uh, Guildford and there was a bus there. And we got on a bus and there was all your intake was on there. So there was 30 of the girls who were going to be in your intake at, um, in the army. And then we drove through the barracks and, you know, that was your home for that next kind of month and a half. And it was really bizarre. It was, it was brilliant. It was absolutely, like, just amazing time because the camaraderie you get, but also the whole sticking up for each other because, of course... You know, when it was Women's Royal Army Corps, it was mainly women that were in charge of you and they were right bitches, I have to say. <laughs> and as soon as there's one thing out of place, you know, your wardrobes are all lifted out, your bed's tipped out, your bedding's out the window, and you're just like, you can't say anything, can you? Because you can't effing blind because you're in the army and it's all yes sir, no sir, feedback's full sir sort of thing, you know. And um, so you soon learn how to stick up for each other in the army, so that was really great. You know, and then I got posted down to Southampton, that was my first uh, posting. It was a port and maritime place. So you used to have to pick up loads of uh, like soldiers, take them down to work, or goods, take them down. And it was the first time I met um, Chris Akabusi. Chris Akabusi, a larger-than-life character, as you can imagine, and as still is, he was the warrant officer. He was never there. He was never in the army. He just wore the uniform when he had to. He was just this athlete that kind of toddled off and then come back. He used to always have a laugh at it with him. And anyway, there was no female physical training instructor. And still, from the age of 14, I wanted, I was desperate to be a physical training instructor. So I was going to do anything to still be this physical training instructor. And there was no, um, no, no females um, taking PT uh, in Marchwood, Southampton. So I went over there and convinced them that I could be good enough to take the girls on PT and started training them. And I remember Akabusi going in there and um, saw see him this time. And he knew, he, I don't know how he found out that he found out that I used to be a runner when I was a junior. And he said to me to go down to Southampton one time and they were training down there. I went down to Southampton, but I was just right squaddy then. I mean, you know, I'd put on lots of weight. I was drinking in the naffy, going out, you know, partying, going on the, um, the boat over across to Southampton. And um, I ran a cross-country race, and I remember this guy screaming and shouting at the side, you know, go on, get it! You know, that's the whole thing, and it's cross-country. I hated cross-country. I still hated it. From that first one I did when I was 12, I still hated cross-country. But because I kept winning, of course, I was always in the team. And then I had then got posted up to York. And uh, it was during cross-country season, I got posted up to York because I, during that 92, had also become a physical training instructor. 92, I, I joined, um, became a physical training instructor, did nine months of training. Um, and so going into 93, uh, it was in the winter, I was posted up to York. And during this cross-country season, um, coming into sort of January, February time, this guy 
found out that I was posted up to York, got the phone number and kept hassling me. Answered the phone, he went, Kelly said, look, I know, you don't know me from Adam. I was the guy at the side of the, you know, cross country screaming and shouting you. I remember you when you were a junior. You've got to start back athletics. He said, you know, you're so good. Anyway, he got me to go to Elin and I went to Elin and I'd, I'd taken down my, my stuff and started training with these athletes and kept beating them all. I used to travel down then each weekend on the weekend and train, but the rest of my training was literally assault courses, you know, tabbing with my big uh, webbing on with all my weights and, you know, with my gun and, you know, march with the guys. And then I'd go down and do like a, you know, Southern Counties and win it. You know, it's like really weird. And anyway, that year I did a Southern Counties, which I ended up doing really well in, which qualified me for the UK Championships, as they called it at the time, which was at Crystal Palace. And the girls in the 800 metre runners race were all like, you know, English, really good English uh, runners on the rankings list and everything. And I went and beat them all. And I qualified for the World Championships. I mean, this was ridiculous. You know, here I was, hardly training at this UK Championships, beating everybody out of sight. You know, I used to call, you know, Corporal Holmes this, have real shaved hair at the back, you know, I was the right sort of <laughs> military girl. And suddenly I qualified for the World Championships in Stuttgart. You know, it's just unreal. I remember running against a girl called Maria Matola, and that's only because this, uh, Andy Norman, who was um, uh, Fatima Whitbread's agent at the time, and also married to her, said to me, follow that black girl. And I just kind of followed her and realised then she was like, you know, one of the world's best athletes. And I'm like trying to charge after her and just scorn free because I found out who she was because at the World Championships in Stuttgart, I'd only got to the semi final. And I remember sitting there watching at the end of track and here comes Maria Matola winning the World Championships. I'm thinking, oh my God, <laughs> you know, that's who I was trying to challenge. And I come back from Stuttgart, all like, I've been to the World Championships and everything. And that night I was staggering on, you know, in my little hut with my weapon. Combat's on, two o'clock in the morning, fog coming down, thinking, oh my God, you know what I mean? That one minute I'm guarding, you know, I'm with this athletics world kind of flying across to, you know, Germany and all these Olympic people there and world-class athletes and the next thing I'm back down to earth guarding my barracks making sure no one breaks through you know with a weapon live rounds you know it's like kind of bizarre that was but it was a good building block I loved I did love it though because I loved my army career so I didn't want to ever you know my army at that time came first <laughs> So when did it all actually come to a halt with the army? My first realisation that it was getting more difficult was when I had to basically go retrade to be a physical training instructor, which meant another six months of training, even though the females had done nine months, the guys only do six, we had to go and do another six months of training. I did the selection and um, I had to make a decision whether I was going to be selected or, you know, have a different trade. And... Um, I was put on this intake and there was 30 of us on there. There's five females and 25 guys. And the selection was really tough. I mean, really, really tough. That at the end of it, only three of us passed and I was the only female out of 30 and two guys. And I um, had to defer my course. And that was the first time it became a conflict with the army because they, being the PT Corps, it's kind of, it's the be all end all. And having been selected out of all that many people, um, the army thought that, you know, it's a no-brainer, I'm going to go on that course, and you know, because everyone's desperate to go on there, you know. And I say to them, well, actually, I might defer my course. It didn't go down well at all. I qualified to run at the European Championships in Helsinki, and it was... Um, it was a really big thing for me because it was the first year that I'd actually focused on some training and trained more than my, you know, two times a week sort of thing. So when I went to those championships, the Russians were the biggest favourite. There were three Russians in the final. And we were looking through the list before I went and one of the athletes was 42 years old. She was saying, oh, she's 42. And I thought, well, she's the same age as me. So I just said, you know, just think of me running in front of you. And I said, you wouldn't like that, would you? <laughs> so she went, no. But the last 300 metres, the three Russians just absolutely, like, went. And I'm now 
think, reacted to it, but not quick enough. I'm now in third place, and we're getting close and close to the finish, and suddenly I remembered what my mama said, and it was that lady in front of me. And I have a picture of I'm literally diving for the line, literally, you know, kind of the whole, <laughs> because didn't care about the fact that I just won a silver medal at the European Championships. I got on the phone to my mum, I was like, I beat you, you know, it's like this whole kind of <laughs> challenge about beating my mother. And uh, she was laughing, obviously. And then I kind of realised, you know, God, I'm a European silver medalist. And, you know, I went back into the army, you know, then they're all like, oh my God, you know, you've just you've been on telly and you're winning these medals and now you're here, you know, taking us around us. <laughs> you know, it's like that whole kind of thing. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, um, and then, of course, the army kind of said, right, so when are you going back on? I booked back on to go on my, um, my course and it was going to be in the summer of 1995. I was still balancing both the army and the athletics, and I got selected for the world championships in 95. So I had a decision. I either go on my six month training course or I go to the world championships. But, you know, it's the world championships. You know, what if I don't ever get a chance to go again? And I thought, well, I defer the course again. So I deferred the course again. But at this time, they kept me, they made me up to a sergeant. I, they kept me, I was at order shot now, and I was still doing my job as a physical training instructor, and I was the only female that they allowed to stay because they knew I was, I was good. At, I know it sounds bad, but I was good at my job. I loved my job. I was always the fastest ranking female of our groups to get selected. So the fact is they either lost somebody that could do their job or, you know, they almost have the... You know, the balance of that whole is an international athlete here still being an army soldier and they got credibility from it, so they kind of did that. It was a massive learning curve for me because I'd never really experienced the kind of whole pressure as I did at these champs, because suddenly I'm now favourite. Yeah. I just didn't focus on the race at all. We got the 200 metres to go and Bullmerker just went and I couldn't respond. You know, and I came and I was just distraught. <laughs> you know, I crossed this line in second place and suddenly I like woke up almost like I knew I ruined my chance. Guide, honestly. I mean, I was strong. I was strong all the way around the race and um, I just couldn't catch her in the end. That's it. <laughs> They were starting to be a little bit kind of pulled from pillar to post, so we didn't really know how to kind of balance it. And it got into 96 and I got a stress fracture at the Olympic Games. And that really was the first time that I realised that I couldn't do both equally as good. I felt this bruise on my leg. So I went to the doctor a couple of days later and I just said, oh, this bruise is really bugging me. You know, and it was starting to make me limp and things when I was going out on a run. He said, oh, we'll just get a scan, just to check. And it showed I had a stress fracture. Oh my God, I was so distraught. And there I was at the Olympic Games holding camp, you know, with a stress fracture. And the doctor's telling me, I've got two choices. You either go home or you risk breaking your leg completely. And I said, well, I'll have to risk breaking my leg completely then, because there's no way I'm going home. I had a x-ray yesterday and it confirmed that I definitely got a hairline stress fracture. So obviously trying to block the pain while I'm competing. We weren't going to have it until the semi-final, but it was very sore today, but um, determined to run. So they're backing me all the way. I think they think that I'm stupid, but you know. <laughs> but she still ran. Do you remember what did you say to her? She do that. Well, yeah, but I mean, you can't tell Kelly not to do something if she's determined to do it. I ran and I got back into the zone you know, I ended up coming fourth. I got pipped on the line. I mean, I literally still got bronze medal. You know, I mean, for me, that's like one of the mo ma most amazing things I could have ever done, to go full of that almost heartache and emotion and pain. I mean, I was in so much pain, but I still came fourth. You know, I got literally pipped on that line. Went back to barracks and on crutches, you know, and I couldn't then be a PTI as I needed to be. It was in 97 that I made my decision because I, Went for the World Championships, I was favourite to win. I got injured, um, ruptured my calf, tore my Achilles. I couldn't do my job at all. And so I ended up saying, well, I'd have to, you know, I think I'd have to make a decision. And I decided to go for the athletics. To be good, I had to concentrate, you know. It wasn't just me, I had 
the odd training partner occasionally, but my coach was always there. But I was the one that had to push myself. You know, I was the one that had to go out silly hours in the morning and night and all different weathers and push yourself to the extreme. So you become single-minded as an athlete. You know, if you want to be the best, you have to think like that. Every time I trained, did a hard training session, I would be literally doubled up in pain. I ovary, I'd wrapped around my fallopian tube, I had my ovary out. Uh, this is all through my athletics career, ovary out. I had, you know, a really bad uh, operation, like women would have a caesarean, but managed to move the muscles up so that it didn't affect me as an athlete, so it took less time to, to get back into running. And, of course, being an athlete, you can't have drugs or nothing, so you're having to manage it with what's available. Um, that kind of helped and things, had a really bad infection in there during this period of time because of the operation and no one really knew about any of that because of course you just keep it private, don't they really? You know, from the injuries, from the ruptured calf and torn Achilles, I thought I'd never get back to that level. And then from these things always going wrong and having an op, even though everyone's so positive and things, you know, of course you've still got healing time, emotional impact, it's all of those sort of things that kind of happen, you know, and then glandular fever I think was just, Kate, a combination of being exhausted from training and getting back to trying to train and all of those sort of things. And somebody said, you're likely not to come back, I'd just prove them wrong. You know, it's like, well, I, want, I so wanted to be an Olympic champion that that's what almost kept the hope going. Well, I mean, you don't know that she's going to get there one day. I mean, that, that, that's the, the whole point. Um, all you can do is just listen and you... Yeah, you sympathise with her, but as a mum, you can't say, look, oh, all right, pack it up now. You know what I mean? You've, you've got to listen to what she was saying, what she was going through. I mean, sometimes she did feel like packing it up. And, you know, you just say to her, well, you do what you think. You know, it's how you're feeling. And if you think you can carry on or if you can't carry on, then, then stop now. You know, you, you do your race and everyone sees that and the glory. And then the next minute, you know, you're on the doctor's table going and feel all that in a private room and then you're going out into the press and, you know, talking to them like nothing's happened back there and all about this medal and no one in the world can know, you know, it's almost like that whole sort of contrast of emotion all the time. I managed to get selected for those um, games. I'd only actually done a couple of races before the games and um, I just was so pleased that I managed to get to those games to be honest and I got into the final you know and then I'm just thinking oh my god you know I'm in the final <laughs> and I don't know what possessed me but with 200 meters to go I went for the line. And then I crossed in third place you know I got a bronze medal and I was just like beside myself. I didn't think I'd get into the semi, let alone the final. And I just gave everything I had. You know, they had to catch me. But I got a bronze medal, it's the only medal that I wanted, and I can't believe it. <laughs> you know, I was so like, you know, I've got this picture of me like roaring, you know, the line thinking, oh God, I've just won a bronze medal at the Olympic Games. I had a race in a place called Pretoria in South Africa. And during that season, I, I knew Maria. So I'd mentioned to her manager, you know, what's the chance of me going and do a bit of training with Maria? And he said, yeah. So I we went up and uh, we all started training together. And actually three weeks, within that three weeks, you know, I just got a whole new lease of life. I was just loving it. You know I mean? My training elevated. I was feeling really good about myself and really positive. And I was 32 years old and I was two years away from the Olympic Games. Everyone asked me about, you know, you got a rivalry and why would you go and train with rivalries? But what people forget is that actually I went there being a really good, formidable athlete. Maria probably and Margot thought, well, actually, being a 1500 metre runner, 800 metre runner, they could get a lot off of me because I had a, a better natural endurance. She was powerful and strong and fast. So actually, our training complemented each other.
when you get injured, people treat the injury problem and they see it because it's an obvious sign, but they don't treat the emotional impact of it. You know, you're looking in the mirror and you just don't really see yourself. You know, don't have anything, nothing comes into your head that, you know, oh, it's all right, or it's okay. Or you just see something different, someone just kind of almost, you know, being like, consumed with emotion. And that's it, I did self-harm, you know. And I don't know why or ha why, or even how I had the guts to do it. You know, to have the guts to actually do something like that. In your book, you describe the moment where you've gone into a bathroom and you found up some nail scissors, haven't you? Is it nail scissors? Scissors is irrelevant. Scissors. <laughs> well, I don't think there's any stage in somebody's head that they think to themselves, oh, I'm going to hurt themselves. You know, it doesn't just come, just almost an emotional release, you know. It's kind of, um, I don't know, it's really hard to describe because it's, uh, you know, why or how you can get into that state. There's nothing worse than seeing your daughter, or I suppose even your son, with a problem. And, and doesn't get what they've been training for and, and, and want. People think the tears are always about, you know, the injury, but actually they might be because you're, you know, feeling down. <laughs> so the only person I told actually was the... I went for a massage and then just, like, broke down in tears. And she brought in the doctor lady, cos I could see I was in a state, and she just, like, sat me down and just talking to me and asking what was wrong and stuff, and I told her everything and... You know, and I still like, felt like I could do something at the Olympic Games. You just said, well, that's your answer. At the end of the day, if you've gone through all of that, you're emotional and this is why you're reacting to, to that is because you want it so badly. Why are you going to give up on it? Because can you imagine it wouldn't have been worth going through all of that hell if you're going to just give up on it now? I suppose World Championships was a massive turning point for me because it could have gone either way. You know, what happened was, is that actually it was the result that I needed to make me believe that I, I'm not going through all this hell for nothing. I'm going there because I'm as good as anybody else in the world. I kind of got a silver medal. And it made me think, that's it, I can, you know, now why can't I just go for my dream and there's nothing else that can get in my way, you know? I just knew there's nothing worse than what I'd gone through I can go through again. I'd almost had such a new energy around me that made me think, do you know what? I will give this 100% chance. This was her last chance, really. And I just sort of said to her, if you're feeling fit and you're feeling good, just, you know, you'll know. Um, that's all you could do. I didn't train with Maria much that year because you get into 2004, it's Olympic year, it's all about yourself, you know? <laughs> like I say, suddenly the uh, mentality around, you know, this is all about you. I remember lying on the settee with, with her one night, having just having a cuddle and talking, and she was saying, oh, you know, do you think I can get a goal, you know, blah, 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 blah. No. But the thing is, we both knew that, I mean, she was 34 then, that this was her last chance, really. When I crossed the line in the 800 metre final, I, I actually did think I crossed the line first. Because you can feel, you know, I mean, I was a step above each other, everyone else. But it's almost straight away, this whole thing of, it's the 800 metres, I couldn't have won the 800 metres. She's won it. She's won it. And Kelly still didn't realise, look, you've won it, Kelly, you've won it, Kelly, you know. And then you suddenly saw her realisation that she knew that she had got it. <laughs> and I was like, this whole, <laughs> it was just really weird to actually think that I'd won the gold medal. One, I'd become Olympic champion, but secondly, that I'd become an Olympic champion at 800 metres was the most surreal feeling ever. 
It was just amazing. I didn't know whether to cry, smile, or, and see the British flag. I mean, I've dreamt of this moment, you know, every day of my athletics career. Yeah, you can't describe it, really. Um, I don't know what to say. I mean, you just think, oh, my God. You can't believe it, to be quite honest with you. You know, just, I just couldn't believe it. I thought I was going to wake up, you know, and I was still having to run the race. It was just unbelievable, but it was almost like that kind of went because suddenly I'm reminded that my dreams are 1,500 metres <laughs> and I've still got to run again. You know, that was a bit weird. Everyone else is celebrating and people at home were going mental and I'm having to get an early night's sleep, but it wasn't, it was 2, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning, couldn't sleep and, you know, there I was having to run again. The director of um, athletics at that stage, Max Jones, I think it was title, one of those, he uh, had said to me that, you know, you've just become one of the all-time greats by winning the gold medal, but if you win two, you become a legend. He was going, I was like, oh, shut up. You know, it's like a whole kind of, like, nervous laugh. What do you want to have? And no-one faced me. And I remember coming down the home, the back straight, and nowhere to lie, and I'm not religious, but I do believe in fate, and I, I literally felt like I was just floating. And I just thought, right, go, and I remember shouting in my head, go! <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> screaming to myself, go! And as I came, it was about 20 metres before the line, I knew I'd won. I crossed over the line and it was literally like the ton weight had just like literally gone off my shoulders. It was really the bizarrest feeling I've ever had, like all of these things. And when I did my lap of honour and that, I was just like, you know, I was just in this kind of daze. It is bizarre seeing your child. You, you know, it's, I don't know, it's just bizarre. It is a weird feeling. I just can't believe it. <laughs> I'm in absolute total. I'm just gobsmacked. I had this homecoming parade on the Wednesday after I got back, and and the nice thing about it was I just knew everyone. You know, everyone that's seen me from a young age, running around the streets and you know, running up the road with a dog or <laughs> whatever, had, were there. You know, all the older people were there, and you know, the kids that I used to see all just there. You saw these elderly people there in their wheelchairs and what, that just done it. Oh, I just burst into tears. You know, to think that they would come out and see my daughter. And all the old people would come down, like the whole of the old people were there sitting on the side in their wheelchairs and on their things and just like, oh my God, you know, they were all like waving their little fags. Oh my God, I'll never forget that for the rest of my life. I'm, I've done some amazing things, met some amazing people, but the one thing that I'd be always so uh, humbled by was that all these people come out to see me, it's amazing. Sports Personality of the Year 2004, Kelly Holmes. Sports Personality of the Year was just an amazing award to get because you realise it was the public that had the chance and choice to decide whether your performances were outstanding enough to be given this award. So when they announced my name, it's just, wow, you know. The support I've had is overwhelming. And from the bottom of my heart, I thank you very, very much. I then got awarded with the European Athlete of the Year, World Sportswoman of the Year, you know, and then I was, had this letter with post about, you know, being awarded a dame by the Queen. <laughs> I mean, when do you ever go up thinking you're going to get, like, a dame by the Queen? It's your daughter that's getting this honour. You, you know, I mean, it's brilliant. I mean, it's fabulous. Um, I'm really excited. <laughs> yeah, very proud. And I turned up there with my mum, my granddad and Mick, um, and uh, we had a brilliant day.